David Lindon. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. I'd like to start by paying tribute to my honourable friend, the member for Cumbernauld, Coalsyth and Kirkintilloch East, I think, when I told him that he'd come top of the private members' bill. He thought that I was just uh, somebody who was interested in places junk, notwithstanding what happened earlier. Um, but actually, it was because I was so keen uh, to see this bill uh, come forward. This, of course, was a bill that I uh, sought to bring forward, I think, in 2018 via the, the 10 minute rule motion. Um, but it is a testament to how generous and how warm my honourable friend is that he has been presented with this opportunity of winning the parliamentary lottery, um, <laughs> an opportunity that many of us would like to see the private members' bill process uh, reformed. But yeah, the fact yeah. that he has taken that on, um, I am incredibly grateful and will be forever in his debt. Um, as he's done too, I, I wish to also pay tribute to the, the, the former minister, the honourable member for Sutton and Cheam. Uh, he and I have been discussing this, meeting about this, being questioned on the floor of this. The House for, for a very long time about it, and it was becoming quite clear that with the absence of an employment bill that the most sensible way of dealing with this, particularly with the cross-party support that we have, was to decouple that and take it as a standalone bill, and I am glad that we have gone down that route. Um, there are a couple of other people that I would just like to, to pay tribute to and to recognise, particularly Katrina Ogilvie from the, the Smallest Things, and Josie Anderson and Beth McCleverty from uh, Bliss. They have been people yeah. that I have been working with for yeah. years on this, and the fact that we are seeing this finally go through the House it is a, a point that is um, something that is an enormous pride. Um, this is, of course, the culmination of many years of work, um, not just by MPs, which I will come on to in a moment, um, but most importantly for the, the parents whose children are born premature or sick. And I think that politics is actually at its best. I, I am not, it's no secret, I am not a fan of this place. I do everything every single day to try and get out of here. But uh, if the House will indulge me just for one moment to say that this is probably one of the, the, the best moments that we've had here, because what we're seeing is politicians coming together, um, putting party politics aside and actually using their personal experience. <laughs> one of the reasons why the All Party Parliamentary Group on Premature and Sick Babies works so well is because the officers of that group all have one thing in common. It isn't the fact that they're members of parliament, it's the fact that they are the parents of premature and sick born babies. So I want to thank my honourable friend from Thornbury and Yate, the honourable lady from Sevenoaks, my honourable friend from Paisley and Renfrewshire North, the honourable gentleman from Broxlow, and indeed my honourable friend from Pontypris, um, who have come together uh, to put that party politics, indeed constitutional politics, aside to ensure um, that we, we do deliver for those families. This is a, a bill that is, is not particularly controversial. It's a relatively short bill. Um, the, the actual the budget line only commits to about fifteen million pounds, as my honourable friend from Thornbury and Gate was saying, in terms of the, the twenty three budget, but it will have a massive impact on the families of those ninety to one hundred thousand babies who every year are born in the UK and spend time in neonatal care. As the House will recall, bo both of my children, uh, Isaac and Jessica, were born premature. Uh, in Isaac's case, we only had about 14 weeks from finding out that he was going to arrive, uh, to him coming into the world. Um, and I still remember that moment when uh, it was moved to an emergency caesarean, whipped away to neonatal intensive care unit. Um, and, and the real worry that was going through that time. Actually, in both cases, for, for both my children, um, my parental leave was well up. Um, by the time they get out of hospital. In the case of my daughter, Jessica, who is now three years old, um, she spent roughly the first year of her life on oxygen um, and, and many, many uh, weeks and months in the, the neonatal intensive care unit. I, I think my honourable friend from Thornbury and Gate kind of hits the nail on the head when he talks about the, the, the mental health impact that this has on parents. Um, I still remember very vividly and well until my dying day watching my daughter turn blue in the incubator with noises, alarms, lights all going off, and neonatal nurses rushing in to resuscitate her. The idea that we as legislators would expect our constituents to be at work when that is happening, or we are still going to do a shift after that, um, really is, I think, something that we are putting right today, because that is a historic wrong. There is also a point as well that for employers, employers will not get the best out of their employees when they are sitting at work, staring into space worrying whether or not their child is going to make it through the day. They are also not going to be in a good space when they realise that mum's back on the neonatal intensive care ward and doctors are coming round talking about massive consequential decisions that families are having to take, whilst the dad or another parent perhaps is sitting uh, in front of a computer in the office. So I think that is why it is so important. 
There are, as my honourable friends have said, good employers out there already, Sony Music, Waltham Forest Council, South Ayrshire Council, who all have innovative policies in place. Interestingly, we have a big debate in this House about proxy voting. As far as I understand it, proxy voting still does not have provision for neonatal uh, care um, leave as well. So, Although there will be a period of time before we can get royal assent, this House could get its own house in order for ensuring that we have some form of neonatal uh, leave immediately yeah. with proxy voting. Um, yeah, I'm happy to give way. Thank you, Honourable Friend, for giving way and, and congratulate him on the excellent work that he has done over many years on this issue. My own Chief of Staff, Stephanie, had two, uh, her twin girls, Abby and Jessica, during the deepest, darkest lockdown of 20, winter 2020. So she had the double pressure of having two premature babies, herself being quite ill, um, and then also having to go in and out of the neonatal unit. And so much of what he says rings true. And I hope I did what I could as an employer. But I felt that my hands were tied as well with the rules of this place. Um, and, and everything he talks about is so... I remember trying to give her all the support I could. Her partner worked offshore. He had to go back offshore and not even be in the same place as her uh, after that. So everything he says and everything that this bill brings forward, does he agree, will be so important to our constituents, our staff, and staff the length of the breadth of the country. It shouldn't be left up to individual businesses to make policies. This needs to be in legislation. Yeah, my honourable friend from Livingston makes a good point. And as well as reforming um, some of the issues around proxy voting in this place, which I accept only impacts a very small amount of us, um, one of the other things that could happen is that um, IPSA, the Independent Parliamentary Standards Authority, um, which is, of course is responsible for, for setting many of the policies and, and conditions around how we uh, as members of this House employ staff um, could certainly do an awful lot more, not just to bring guidance, but to, to reform uh, their rules. Um, as I was making the point, that, you know, that there are a number of good employers out there, I've, I've mentioned them already, um, but one of the things that we saw as a result of the P&O scandal is that there are, sadly, still far too many employers out there who are uh, too tempted to gild the lily, to, to cut corners uh, and to, to undercut the, their, their staff. Um, now, I, I will not depart from being very conscious that this is a, a you know, cross-party consensus this morning. I won't depart from a belief that you know, the sooner that we have an employment bill before this House, the better, yeah, um, so that yeah, we, we can try and deal with some of the other issues. My honourable friend, the member for Lanark and Hamilton East, for example, has an excellent proposition on uh, miscarriage leave as well in pay. Um, so I think it is, it's really important that, that the Minister looks to see how we can bring forward an employment bill. But ultimately, this bill will end the, the, the lottery that far too many employees across these islands have to pay. Um, I would agree with uh, my honourable friends from Thornbury and Yate about the, the need to, to expedite this bill. I still have a concern um, that although we're getting the, the bill a second reading today, let's get it into committee as soon as possible. Let's get it to the Lords. My preference, frankly, would be to do all stages on the floor of the House. There is precedent for that, given the immense cross-party agreement on this. This is the kind of thing that, frankly, we could get through in the space of a couple of hours. Um, there is one other thing that I would, I would put a challenge directly to uh, whoever the, the two final candidates are for Prime Minister. I understand that there will be an enormous temptation on the part of whoever becomes the new Prime Minister to call a snap election. The danger with calling a snap election in that regard is that the House would prorogue and that this bill would not receive royal assent. So I would like to get a commitment from both those candidates that they won't play fast and loose with that as well. Um, there are many, many more things that we can do to try and support um, families who have had premature and sick babies. We need to look at the neonatal workforce. Um, that is an absolute ticking time bomb um, that is going to go off in about 10 years' time. We need to look at the school admissions code, certainly in England. We need to look right across the UK at the poor uh, hospital accommodation for parents. Um, far too many parents are, are having to stay in, in hotels well off-site. Um, that is particularly challenging, for example, for, for mothers who are breastfeeding um, but, uh, and all sorts of other issues as well. Um, and my honourable friend, member for Cumberall, Cosyth and Kirk and Tillakees, has already made uh, reference to the Neonatal Expenses Fund, something that we have in Scotland. We are incredibly lucky to have that, but that is not something that is available to our friends in other parts of these islands. And then, Lastly, one of the things that we are going to have to look at is the um, postcode lottery, the absolute desert of counselling that exists across health boards and NHS trusts. I think it has been well rehearsed this morning that you know, having a baby that is born premature or sick it can have a, a serious detrimental impact on the, the mental health of parents, um, and frankly, it is just up to your luck whether or not you get that support at that time. So I very much look forward to, to this bill going into committee, uh, ensuring that it passes the House uh, speedily and can receive royal assent. And with that, I commend it to the House. Yeah. Yeah.